So here's a question for you. How, how many people here today have lost their mothers? Just raise your hand. Okay, so that's a lot of people. So me too. I lost my mother when I was 19. Um, and for years, I always thought of my mother as an angel. I always thought of my mother as hovering over my life, helping my life, directing my life, certainly in my early years. And I always imagined her, mostly I would imagine her in audiences where I was performing. And so if I was like on stage, and it was usually in a balcony, she's usually up in the balcony, because that's where angels sit, up in the balcony. And I would always think about her up there in the balcony watching me because she never really got to watch my career as it unfolded. In fact, when she died, I was 19 and a, a, a sophomore in college, and her death caused me to leave college and just move to New York, and the rest is history. Um, <laughs> I moved to New York and instantly started working and always envisioned her up there. And I, I have a little story about um, West Side Story, for those of you who don't know, I was in that. Um, <laughs> See, not a lot of people are laughing. Some of you don't know, right? Who doesn't know that I was a star on Broadway? Thank you. This talk is for you. So, <laughs> so um, when, I, when I did West Side Story, uh, the night before opening night, the night before all the critics came, um, I fell during the show. There was this one, and it was in my number, in Cool, the number Cool, and there's this thing where you do these knee spins. I don't know what, Jerome Robbins was like, just cruel. These knee spins all the way down to the front, and then you do this, and go all the way down without touching the floor. All the, I can't even go in, I can't even do it. All the way down, right? And on the night before the critics, I slipped out of my knee spins, and I literally crashed and burned. Front and center, Minskoff Theater, 1,500, 2,000 people watching, and, and they screamed. People were like, ah! And then I got back up and let it just play it cool. <laughs> um, so the next night I was a little apprehensive, a little scared. As I was going out there, I'm, I'm just like, dear God, at the time I would pray to the God in the skies who was in charge of all this, and he even made me slip, it wasn't my fault. And <laughs> it's, it's not like I didn't warm up that night, which I didn't. Um, so I'm, I'm like, I'm praying, you know, don't let me fall, don't let me fall. Everybody's out there. Lauren Bacall's out there. Tommy Toon is out there. All my friends are out there. The New York Times is out there. Don't let me fall. Which was probably not the best use of my consciousness in that moment, right? Um, but I remember being on stage at the beginning, and when the curtain went up, I looked out, and I looked up to the balcony, and I was like, my mother's here. She is up there, and there is no way in hell that she's going to let her son fall in front of all these people. And I had this calm come over me, and I was like, great. And I did brilliantly. I did those knee spins. I, I wish there was a video of that night, because my image of my face must have been, I finished the knee spins and went, yeah! <laughs> Which was not really appropriate for that moment in the show. <laughs> but that's probably what happened. So my mother was a stay-at-home mother. How many of your mothers were stay-at-home mothers? How many of you are stay-at-home mothers? Okay, do you see the difference in the numbers? We've changed. But my mother was a stay-at-home mother, and she was actually expected to be a stay-at-home mother. It was expected of women to stay home and raise the children while the men went out and foraged and killed. Because um, <laughs> we lived in Philadelphia. So there's a quote, thank you, bum bum. So uh, there's a quote by a successful businesswoman, Leslie McIntyre, and she says this. Nobody objects to a woman being a good writer or sculptor or geneticist if at the same time she manages to be a good wife, good mother, good looking, good tempered, well groomed, and unaggressive. <laughs> yeah. The title of my talk today is A Mother's Passion. Oh, what a great picture, Barbara. Yes, a mother's passion. So, you ever hear the term, the lioness, the fierce lioness mother? How many of you, male or female, feel that fierce lioness inside of you at times? The rest of you? Lambs? <laughs> I think we all have this fierce, fierce lioness. I have a little story about my son. 
about my whole family. We went to see a, uh, and I meant to text Will to see if he was okay with me sharing this, but I forgot. I'm going to do it and trust and know he'll be fine. Um, you think? He'll be fine. Kevin will stop me if I'm going into it. So anyway, he's playing, so was it soccer? Soccer. He's playing soccer. So there is Nora, me, Kevin, and a lacrosse story. It's sports. He was in sports. Well, they're all the same. <laughs> so it was Nora and me. I'm the wife. Come <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. It's tough being up here when they turn. You know? So back to me. So. It's Nora, me, Pat, and that Pat is their, their mom, their biological mother, and Kevin. And we're watching this lacrosse game. Well, Will, Will Will's apparently more like me than I think, uh, is a little, little sports and directionally challenged. So they put him into the game, and we're all so excited, and he's just playing terribly. And there's a person behind us. Oh, and, and then a ball comes to him. Was it a ball? Did he play with a ball? I was probably not paying attention. So the, whatever it is comes to him, and he, and he runs, and, we're, and I'm screaming, oh, my God, oh, my God, and he literally hits it into the net of the opposition's team, net. <laughs> and so they're all screaming at him. He thinks they're screaming, go, Will, but they're saying, no, Will, and he goes and he hits it into that, the wrong zone. Um, well, the person behind us, or actually a lot of people behind us, but somebody just said, that kid is just, he, he's like an idiot. He's so stupid. And I'm listening to this, and I'm like, uh-oh, because Pat is a lioness. And I'm like, and I, so I put my hand on her leg, and I was like, Pat, and she turns around, and she just looks at, the, she stares this person down, and, and the person goes, I'm so sorry. And Nora says, so are we. <laughs> <laughs> and we were just dying laughing at, at, at that. And then we had to make Nora promise she would not bring it up when he came to the car. I said, this is not a discussion we're having. He did a great job today, and Nora's just like... <laughs> so he comes to the car, and he goes, did you see me? Did you see me? <laughs> and we're like, yeah. Yeah, and Nora's like, uh-huh. He says, I have finally got a nickname. I have a nickname now. They call me Wrong Way. <laughs> the reason I bring that up is because there is this mother energy inside of us that just wants to protect our children. And that doesn't just mean our biological children, those who we consider our children. I consider every, almost every child my child if I see anything going wrong in the world. But that certainly the children of Global Truth Center, I think of as my children. It's one of the reasons why I go to teen camp. It's one of the reasons why they've actually talked me into going again this summer. I'm telling that for Eric Overholzer who didn't know that. Um, because I love, I, I, there's just some, I wanna protect, don't you? You just see these, and same thing for your projects, your husband, your wife, your lovers, your family. There's just this lioness quality inside of us, and it is the mother, divine mother energy. Um, English novelist Joseph Conrad wrote this. Being a woman is a terribly difficult task since it consists principally in dealing with men. <laughs> I think I heard most of the men laughing. So, so here's the thing. Mother, father, and I, I'm so happy that Dr. Ellen got to say what she said because it's what, what talk is about. We think that there are mothers and there are fathers. There is so much duality in the world. Now, of course, the feminine seems like the mother. I mean, the, gives birth and it's called mother, and then there's the father. But I think it's still titles and I, uh, that we need to stop thinking of as, as dualistic because I believe that the mother-father within each one of us is totally available if we're willing to tap into it. And, and I know we're joking about, there's no husband and wife in our, our marriage, there's just two men in love with one another. But I, 
but I know I am very much in touch with. I, I felt like I had a biological clock ticking when I was in my 30s and early 40s. And we just were talking to a friend of ours, a gentleman, who said he felt his biological clock ticking, and, and I totally knew what he meant, even though in the room they were like, what? But I get it, it does, to, to want to have children, to want to birth something into the world. You know, I always, remember that movie with Joan Rivers where, she, where, where uh, the male was giving birth? It's called Rabbit Test, it did very poorly. <laughs> Clearly none of you have seen it. But it was a movie where the man gave birth, and I think I was like 25 or something at the time, and I remember thinking, oh, I hope that happens. I would love to be able to give birth. <coughs> the problem is, the child would, it would be like he was in an episode of No Exit. <laughs> I'll wait for you to figure that out. But just the idea of giving birth, I've always found very fascinating. Um, so the world makes us... That got you, right, Linda? <laughs> so, um, so this world we live in makes us different. It does this, men are from Mars, women are from Venus. Did anybody read that book? I had such a hard time with that book. I'm like, do we need any more books to tell us that we're different, that we're separate, we're not the same? No, we don't. We need more to tell us we are one. We are the same person. I, you, I am the I am. You are who I am. I am who you are. And yet, we all have our own unique gifts to the world. Women get to birth, but they can't birth it themselves. Well, they can once it's in there. But they, they can't create it themselves. That's the magic of all of this. So we, we have both the father and mother energy, and I wanted to read you what Ernest Holmes said about it. He said, spirit is the father, mother, God because it is the principle of unity back of all things. The masculine and the feminine principles both come from the one. He says the soul has been called the universal feminine or the holy womb of nature because it is receptive and creative. Now what's interesting is when we teach science of mind, we do teach the masculine and the feminine. We teach the masculine as the conscious mind, and we teach the feminine as the receptive law that takes what conscious mind puts into it. A lot of times there's a problem with teaching that that way, because what you're saying is the woman just takes whatever the man puts into her and then brings it out as form, as if it has no choice whatsoever. So I think we got to learn, it. we, we got to learn, I think I have to learn how to speak. I think we have to learn how to teach this in a much more respectful manner. Because we're all the father and we are all the mother. We all get to participate in this thing called creativity. You know, yesterday in class we talked about my being receptive, it's what sets up my life. The feminine, what we call the feminine energy, the mother energy, is the very thing that allows me to change my life, to create my life if I'm willing to be receptive to what I choose to create, then I get to create my life. But I have to be willing to be receptive. So that's one question I wanna ask you today. How receptive are you? How receptive, said very, <laughs> good for you. So how receptive are you to letting your divine knowing flow through you and create the life you want? And here's what I really wanna say about this. It's not just the receptivity, how much blockage is in there? How much is blocking your ability to receive? Most of what's in there that's blocking you is, a, is an understanding that you've created and designed from all of this, and it may not really be serving you. You wanna give birth to something? You want to be the mother energy that gives birth to something? Then you need to get everything else out of the way. How many people have been in a birthing room when a woman is giving birth? Okay, well then you know what I'm gonna say. She doesn't want anything near her. Nothing, right, Yvette? Nothing. Get away from me. I'm just, I want this out, <laughs> right? Th that's what we have to do with our conscious minds. I want everything away from me other than what I am giving birth to. That's how we create. We create by knowing this is mine to deliver and everything else that's getting in the way, get out of this room. What if, we choose, what if we used our minds that way? Because I tell you, we have a lot of stuff in there that also wants to be birthed at the same time. 
And the question ends up being, what do you want to birth? What do you really want to birth? And then get everybody else out of the room. Uh, Betty Grable, who pinup girl in World War II, she said this. The practice of putting women on pedestals began to die out when it was discovered that they could give orders better from up there. <laughs> but I just have to say, we need to be giving orders. None of us needs to be on a pedestal, but every single person here needs to know how to give orders to their mind. You don't let your mind just run rogue. You need to give orders. This, this thought I am having, backed by this belief, this works for me. This thought, out. This doesn't work. You're going to tell me in any way, shape, or form that I am weak, I am less than, I'm not perfect, then go. Because that's not going to work for me. I need to be able to give orders to my mind exactly what it is I want. And I want you to know, you need to be specific. If you want to buy a home, how many people say, I'm going to buy a home. I'll just let the real estate agent give it to me. He'll pick one out. I'll move into it. No. You go looking. You decide. You give the order. This is what I want. I want a two-story house. I want three bedrooms, three bathrooms. I want a yard, long, big backyard. I want a pool and a jacuzzi. I want Nick Williams to have done all of the landscaping. <laughs> this is it. That's giving orders. And now the real estate agent, oh, you're not an agent anymore. The real estate, there are a bunch of them here today. Who's real estate agents? Don't your clients tell you what they want, Corrine? Yeah. And your job is to go find that. And even though you find it, it still may not be what they want because they know how to order up what it is they want. That's giving birth. Dolly Parton said this, I was the first woman to burn my bra. It took the fire department four days to put it out. <laughs> <laughs> that's the mother energy that is a woman who knows who she is knows what she is birthing and doesn't care how many people it takes to get it done it's going to get done do you do that with your mind do you do that with your mother feminine energy so our last thought my last thought about mother energy First of all, it's all energy, right? That's what God is. God is this energetic flow of creative essence. It's who I am. It's what Stephanie is. De I was going to say Daryl. Delaney is. That, that's Delaney Farrell shortened, Daryl. Um, right. Yes. Yeah. So, so there's, this, there's this thing inside of us, this energetic creativity, and it's ours to use. Now, the way we teach it is the masculine is the pointer. The masculine takes all of that and points it out and says, but you know what? I just think we have to stop with the masculine and feminine because ultimately, it's just my divine self that points exactly what it is that's mine to do. Period, end of sentence. So Thich Nhat Hanh wrote a beautiful quote. He said this, you carry Mother Earth within you. She is not outside of you. Mother Earth is not just your environment. In that insight of inner being, it is possible to have a real communication with the earth, which is the highest form of prayer. So when he says Mother Earth, he's talking about the whole enchilada, really. Because are we not part of Mother Earth? We also have to move that paradigm we have to be willing to say, I'm not standing on the earth, I am the earth. The earth stands through me. You know, the, I am not looking at an ocean, I am the ocean. I am not laying on a, on a boat looking up at the stars, I am the stars. And that's what Thich Nhat Hanh is saying. There is a mother energy within us, a divine, natural mother energy that knows it is connected in the womb to everything and has the capacity and the ability to take that and bring it into form in our lives. And it's everywhere we look. You know, there, uh, we had our, we, a friend of ours moved and they had two myrtle trees that had been on either side of their yard. And it was very yard, their back, their, their yard. They were on either side of the, the fence. And because it was against the fence either side, the, the back side that was hitting the fence had not grown, it was just all kind of dead just the front grew. 
So there they were on either side of the yard. Think of the masculine and the feminine being separated, pushed apart, to go grow separately, not together, separately. And the backsides had become very dry and, and kind of dead. So they, they were moving, they sold their house, and they were about to tear down everything in the backyard. So Nick's men went and got those two myrtles because I didn't want them to be destroyed. And we brought them to our yard and put them next to each other. And one day I was out in the backyard, and I, I'm in the front yard, and I'm looking at them, and I'm just going, they're so beautiful, but they're still both leaning this way towards the sun, and the backs are not coming in because that's where they get their sun. So yesterday, I got to witness something that was so beautiful, so amazing. I came here to teach, but Kevin stayed at home like a good wife would, and <laughs> totally kidding. I came here to teach. Kevin stayed at home with the gardeners, and when I got home, those two myrtles, the masculine and the feminine, had been brought together with their side that was not growing put against the other side that was not growing, planted into the ground right in front of our house, and it looked so magnificently beautiful as if that's how it grew out of the ground. And it looked so happy and so healthy, and it was round, and it was just more than I had anticipated even. But I knew what I'd be talking about today. I knew it was the perfect ending for this because if we can take our masculine and our feminine and realize that we are all of it. Because to the degree that you knock out the masculine women, half of you is drying out. And to the degree, men, that you are knocking out the feminine, which you have at least 50% of, half of you is drying out. And I believe it is time to take the masculine and the feminine, to bring them together as one, and watch what happens. Watch how they grow in perfect symmetry. Watch how they become the very divine brilliance that they were meant to be. So whenever you hear yourself say something like, well, guys don't do this, or, you know, I should really be a lady more, or whatever a woman might say, really listen to yourself, hear yourself. You're all of it, absolutely all of it. And I know one of the great things about Nora was she knew that. She would sometimes walk into the kitchen with, with jeans and I, I would look at her and go, Nora. She's like, what? <laughs> she was so in touch with both sides of herself. And, and Will is too. And you know what? The younger generation seems to be. They just, this whole gender fluidity, they get it. We have boxed them in into these identities that no longer fit people because they're starting, and you know why they don't fit? Because they're just, they're feeling it all, and they're not pushing half of it down. So those of us who didn't grow up in that era, which is probably most of us, what an awesome time for us to be alive, to get to start discovering a side that perhaps we've been either ignoring or saying does not, and, and it has nothing to do with sexuality, by the way. This is just about gender. Knowing I am not just a boy. I am a boy, I am a girl, I am divine humankind. I am all of it in this body. That's what will give us so much more to understand in life. Just imagine, imagine if there's 50% of you you've never even tapped into because you're too busy being what we've been taught we should be. So I honor every single person here today as the divine motherhood. And I especially honor the women who have given birth or have nurtured anyone in their lifespan. But I do think today's a great day, as Thich Nhat Hanh said, to really get it. If I'm gonna say I'm one with everything, that means I am one of everything. And when I really get that, when I live from that perspective, I can go see, you know, Notting Hill and cry my eyes out in front of the world and not care that may, may not be a manly thing to do or a woman could become president of the United States and be aggressive enough and have the, the cojones <laughs> to actually do the work and not be told that that's offensive. It is time, it is time for us to stop putting people in boxes or putting beautiful myrtle trees against walls and encouraging half of them to die. Namaste. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you.